Okay, um, welcome back to another episode of The CEO and the Lobster. And this week, no hot sauce, sadly, but we are talking about something equally as exciting and interesting and potentially scary, um, which is bridges, bridges in cryptocurrency. So this is a really um, quite a fascinating and quite an in-depth topic. We'll try to make it straightforward and give you guys an overview of what these are and how they work, but also some of the challenges with it, with them. First off, though, what are bridges and why do we need them? So as you are probably aware, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies or tokens in crypto, but there's also lots of different blockchains that they run on. Some currencies are quite simple. Bitcoin runs on the Bitcoin blockchain and it pretty much just sits there. Whereas other currencies can run on a whole lot of different blockchains, Ethereum, Polygon, Phantom, a lot of coins can sit on different networks. And the reason that you might want to use different networks is to save on gas fees, to use different applications. Um, but all of these different networks are separate um, and there are interoperability issues when you're trying to move coins from one network to another, which is where bridges come in. And a good way that you can think about this is that the the coin or the, um, you know, say you're interacting with, what's a good example token for this one, Patrick? USDT, it exists on oh, most major correct. networks, so yeah. Yeah, as well as some non-EVM ones. That is true. So USDT, say you've got USDT on Ethereum and maybe you want to move it to Tron or TRX to have a lower network fee for some transactions you're doing. Um, and you can think about this like, say you receive a letter in the mail and you want to send that letter on to your accountant or your lawyer. Um, and instead of, you could make the decision to forward it, you know, physically in the post or you could transfer that letter onto a different form, such as scanning it and emailing it and send it on a different network email. So you can think of Ethereum and Tron and all of the other networks as being different communication channels. So postal mail versus email, and you can move the same information um, if you can bridge it from one format to another. So there's two types of bridges. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of different levels in this, but the two main types are cross-chain bridges and Oracle bridges. So a cross-chain bridge um, facilitates communication between these different blockchain networks. So they enable the transfer of tokens and or assets between blockchains, allowing users to access and utilize them on one or the other. And they do this through a process of burning or getting rid of the tokens on one chain and minting or creating new tokens on the other chain. Um, the other one is Oracle Bridges, which do a very similar thing, but do that through connecting blockchains to external data source. And that's enabling the transfer of off-chain data, which is, I guess, kind of like the mail, um, the physical mail, into on-chain smart contracts. And this is um, something we'll probably talk about in another episode, but really useful for the decentralized application or DAP ecosystem to enable them to have real-world data that can be used on blockchain. So that's a bit of a probably too long of a talk about what these things are, but um, how do they actually work, Patrick? Can you give us a bit more of a rundown? Oh, I can give a massively, massively long rundown. I will try to keep this short, though. So something can't physically move between these two networks. These networks are fundamentally separate. If they were connected, it would be the one network, right? So what needs to happen is you need to kind of figure out ways that we can jump information between the two. And the, the mail example is a really good one, right? Like the two communication things are too similar, but they fundamentally don't interact. So for this example about how they work, we're going to use USDT and we're going to use between Ethereum and Polygon, very similar chains, but slightly different. So there's two types of bridges. Both of them kind of actually work in the same way, centralized bridge and a decentralized bridge. The first thing you need to do is send the funds, the tokens, the XYZs that you want to move across chain to that centralized or decentralized smart contract. And that smart contract will then lock it up because there's no way to physically jump things across chains. What that smart contract then does is it speaks to the corresponding smart contract, or if it's a centralized address, just the address on the other chain, and then creates a token, a representation of the original asset you sent over. So you get some really, really interesting situations where you've got, say like USDT, let's, let's use that as an example. It's a tokenized version of the US dollar on Ethereum. And then you've sent it to this address, it gets locked up, and then they tokenize the tokenized US dollar on the other chain. And then you're free to move around that tokenized thing. And then when you want to bring it back, you just bring it back to the second address you used, they'll burn that token, and then they'll release the underlying asset there. So it's a- But hold on, they're not actually releasing the original ones. You're not, you're actually adding another layer of tokenization, not going back one, right? So it's a tokenized version of a tokenized version of a tokenized asset. Uh, so depending on which way it's moving, if 
it's this is more of a very much a layer two kind of thing but yeah if there's the underlying asset there they'll release it in exchange it's kind of like a certificate of deposit right that you've deposited something you get a contract saying hey yeah i own this thing and then you can trade and do whatever you want and then the other person can come back with that certificate of deposit there uh but it comes really really interesting there's been a few issues where there's been like two chains and everything's moved in one direction on one chain and they've tried mm. to move it back uh, one bridge and they've tried to move it back on the other bridge and it gets like really really complicated and there's had to be like backroom deals and stuff it's it's a really interesting space um, and the other thing that happens a lot in the space is hacks right yes. so we've probably you probably don't have to have been around crypto long to have heard about um, bridges being hacked and this can happen on centralized or decentralized bridges um, and there's, um, yeah, there's a lot of reasons why bridges can get hacked, but probably two of the most common ones, um, uh, and, and, and I guess going back to sort of why bridges are hacked in the first place, like they are massive honeypots, right? So as you were talking about before, any funds that are moved across the bridge, they're not actually moved. They're just locked up on one side and reissued on the other side. And so you've actually got a huge pool of money sitting on that original, that sort of first end of the bridge that if someone can um, manipulate their way through the smart contract and sort of... Um, yeah, effectively hack into it, they can release those funds sitting at that, you know, that lockup address. And then I guess the second thing is that while the tokenized versions of the assets are similar to that of the original asset, they're not exactly the same, right? You don't have fungibility between USDT on ETH and on Polygon or on TRX. Um, so there are any, there can be controls or protections that are built in onto the asset. So for example, stable coins like USDT, they have the ability to pause um, transfers or to blacklist addresses that funds cannot be sent or received from particular addresses. Those controls though might only exist on the original network, not on a layer two. And so the developer might have put these controls in on the original one, and then those could be circumvented or um, you know, hacked again on the new layers. So yeah, there's a lot of ways that things can go a little bit wrong on, on bridges, and a lot of it really comes down to the quality of the code. And the you know, if you're, lo if you're looking at using bridges, really I would recommend doing your homework on have those bridges been audited, have those smart contracts been really thoroughly checked and vetted. And also just the standard thing of how long has this bridge been around? You know, A new bridge that's only just come out on market, much more risky than something that's been around for a very long time yeah and that's just a shout out easy crypto because i feel like that's my job if you want a token on a different network that's actually a service that we offer if you want usdt on xyz networks we can actually handle a lot of that stuff yeah. for you and make crypto a little bit easier for you so look, um, to sum up, bridges are pretty complicated. Hopefully this has though given you a little bit of an understanding of what they are and what function they fill in the crypto, crypto ecosystem. But do remember that if you are bridging assets, there is always an element of risk there. So do your own research, um, make sure you're dealing with legitimate and reputable bridges um, if you do need to use them. And if you're not sure, feel free to reach out. As Patrick said, we can not only help with um, you know, giving you assets on different networks, but we can also give advice and tips on bridges that we use and trust and maybe ones which, um, yeah, you want to look into if you're looking for particular asset swaps. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, thanks again for listening. And yeah, maybe next week we'll pick up dApps or something else, dive into more detail on one of these other crazy crypto areas. Sounds good. See you all till next time.